Are you sure? Here's the 30 second lesson on what legends know. Never ask a bride why she's getting married. Don't wear a skirt on a windy day. Deodorant is not a shower. Don't sniff chili flakes. <laughs> and don't forget, saving is not investing. Legends don't just save, they invest in mutual funds. Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully. Hello and welcome to this episode of Macro Sutra. I'm TCA Sharad Raghavan, Deputy Editor at The Print. And now the budget is just next week. And so, of course, we're going to be talking to you about what are the kind of things that can happen. But we're going to look at it from a broad lens. Should the government stick to fiscal consolidation, be responsible, or should it spend lots and try to boost demand, put more money in the hands of the people, and spend more on CapEx? These are the kinds of choices that we're going to be looking at. And to, of course, look at all of them, discuss all of it, we have with us Radhika Pandey, Associate Professor at NIPFP. Thank you so much, Radhika, for Thank joining Thank you, Sharad. So, Radhika, let's first start off. Uh, can we get an overview of the economic growth and the fiscal numbers right. for the government so that we have an idea of how much freedom it has to spend or not spend? Absolutely. So it's useful to look at the macro fiscal backdrop within mm -hmm. which the budget is being presented. And if we look at that, we see that, you know, the growth numbers are quite robust. We right. saw that for uh, the last financial year, economy grew by 8.2%. And even for this financial year, economy is expected to grow by more than 7%. Right. We also saw recently that IMF has upped its projections for uh, India by 20 basis points. ADB has also upped projections. So on overall growth, numbers, India's economy looks uh, robust. And also, if we look at the uh, fiscal deficit numbers, uh, what was projected last year was 5.9% of GDP. Right. As per the revised estimates, it uh, got reduced to 5.8% of GDP. But when the actuals came out, uh, we see that fiscal deficit uh, government has bettered its estimates and uh, fiscal deficit came in at 5.6% of uh, GDP. Uh, also, if we look at current account deficit, because we need to look at the twin deficits which include both fiscal deficit and current account deficit mm -hmm. to get a sense of macro stability uh, for the fourth quarter current account uh, balance was in surplus so all this gives a comfortable uh, picture of the macro fiscal uh, landscape and also if we look at the tax revenues they have been buoyant uh, uh, the tax revenues, both direct and indirect taxes, have done better than their revised estimates. Even for the first two months for which we have data for the current financial year, mm -hmm. we see that tax revenues have remained uh, buoyant uh, and fiscal deficit has been only 3% of GDP. Part of it has to be due to the fact that because of elections, code of conduct spending was not too much. Right. But revenue part is uh, robust. And the biggest highlight is that the government has received uh, 2.11 lakh crore as dividend from the RBI. Now, that is much more than the anticipated, much more than what was projected, uh, which was uh, around 1 lakh crore. Mm -hmm. So the government has got an additional more than 1 lakh crore uh, to spend or to retire its debt or to control its deficit. So there are various policy options that we can talk about. So this is the uh, broad framework uh, if we talk about the, uh, you know, the overall economy. But then when we delve deeper and look at some of the sectoral growth rate, right. there we see unevenness in growth and particularly consumption has been a cause of concern. Right. We have seen that consumption, private consumption growth has been uh, tepid at 4%. And interestingly, the recent uh, consumer confidence survey that came out uh, for the month of May, it shows a moderation in the consumer confidence index for the current period. So remember, consumer confidence index gives us uh, a current perception index and future expectation. Yeah, one year ahead. One year ahead. Mm -hmm. But for the current index, there has been a moderation. And a part of it has to be uh, driven by high inflation. Inflation, food inflation has remained uh, quite stubborn. And that is now getting reflected in the purchasing power, uh, demand and uh, uh, incomes of people. So this broadly sums up the macro fiscal landscape of the economy. Okay, so then broadly, it looks like the government has some space, some fiscal room Absolutely. to spend yes. and the economy is giving some sort of signals 
that these are the areas that need some help absolutely but broadly then uh, let's talk a little about the two broad options that the right. government has one is fiscal cons- consolidation and the other of course is increasing spending uh, we'll go over the pros and cons but if we're talking about pre- fiscal consolidation then what would that look like so uh, for if we look at the interim budget we mm-hmm. saw that uh, the government projected a fiscal deficit of 5.1% of gdp for the current year right. this is fy25 now given the uh, fiscal space that has been rendered possible due to the uh, more than expected rbi dividends and buoyancy in tax revenues uh, one of the policy option could be to reduce it further that is you know in the full year budget we we could see that the uh, 5.1% of fiscal deficit could be reduced to 5% or 4.9% right. that is uh, going forward aggressively on the path of fiscal consolidation because they do have a target they do have a target because fy26 is uh, 4.5% so uh, there because given the fiscal space one possibility is that the government goes more aggressively on fiscal consolidation mm-hmm. and the other option is that it retains its uh, uh, target at 5.1% or maybe a tad lower by say 20 or 30 basis point but use this uh, extra fiscal space to uh, you know uh, promote sectors or uh, support sectors that have been lagging so those are the two policy broad policy option uh, ideal situation would be to strike some kind of a balance between the two okay. that is uh, you know stimulate provide focused support to sectors that need attention while not losing sight of fiscal prudence Okay so now we've been talking about these sectors and areas that need some help so let's look at the possible demand boosting measures that that can be taken what would they look like Yeah so uh, from the demand side you know one of the step that could be taken is to cut income taxes mm-hmm. or to at least increase the exemption limit because if we look at the structure of income taxes we know that in 2020 government introduced the new tax regime right. uh, which is uh, which does not have uh, any exemptions but but it has lower rates, but it has lower rates. Mm-hmm. and the government has been pushing for this new simplified tax regime uh, which is uh, which has less of uh, exemption options and uh, lower taxes so while that has been the uh, focus till now i think given that inflation has remained stubbornly high and uh, the purchasing power of people in real terms has actually declined because of higher inflation it makes sense to provide some kind of uh, tax concession it may be in the form of increasing the uh, tax exemption limit it may be in the form of increasing standard deduction it may be in the form of providing uh, some kind of uh, you know a, Uh, increase in the uh, investment limit under section 80c so there are various policy options but at least if some kind of signal is given that the government is serious about uh, boosting demand that will be a good sentiment booster also and it will promote demand so there could be various policy pathways for okay. uh, boosting demand so now there are two things here one is that uh, the government itself has said that it's not really in favor of increasing exemptions right. it wants people to move to the new tax regime Absolutely. which has no exemptions and lower rates yeah. so most likely we'll see maybe a cut in rates for the new regime right rather than an increase in exemption yeah. limits yeah that and is possible yes the second thing is that every single year people ask for uh, tax breaks and tax cuts and all of that and they don't happen so what is making this year different that it's a little more urgent that they happen firstly the election results that has i think that shows that there is a need to cut taxes uh, to boost demand and various indicators are now uh, you know flagging these signals that consumption demand is tepid and something needs to be done about it uh, rural inflation has remained quite high and mm-hmm. if we look at the uh, overall inflation rural inflation has uh, you know that the wedge between rural and urban inflation is rising so there is a scope and given that the government has fiscal space so there could 
could be a possibility of uh, uh, cutting tax rates for the middle class. Since 2017-18, the taxes as such, they have not been any cuts in taxes. Right. So those are some of the uh, reasons why there is a need but, and also to protect against inflation because inflation has been rising and to at least ensure that the standard of living, cost of living is protected, standard of living is protected. I think there is a need to provide some tax concessions this time around. So that is the thing. And the other uh, area which requires attention is, of course, the rural and the farm sector, because right. we have seen that consumption is growing, but there is a lot of unevenness and inequality in consumption. So the schemes which are generally uh, for employment, which have employment generating potential for rural sectors, uh, they should be given focus. They were given focus in the interim budget, and right. that focus should continue. Uh, Pradhan Mantri Gram Sadak Yojana, Avas Yojana. We have already seen in the first cabinet meeting after election, government announced 3 crore more houses under PM Avas Correct. Yojana. Yes. So all these are very positive steps because uh, first they help in improving the standard of living and secondly they help in improving the employment generating potential. And also Manrega. Manrega has something, you know, it has the uh, ability to cushion uh, people at the time when there is rural distress. So that is again something that should uh, have focus. There was a 86,000 crore allocation in the interim budget. It needs to be seen whether they keep it or increase it. So these are some of the uh, areas that broadly uh, can be categorized as demand boosting measures because anything either you cut taxes or provide income to the people in the form of uh, either cash transfers like PM Kisan or provide them employment generation uh, potential that will help in boosting demand. Right. Okay. So now by choosing these right. over going for fiscal consolidation, are there any downsides? The downside is only that you will delay the path towards fiscal consolidation. Uh, and again, as I said, there's some kind of balance has to be struck. And given that the current macroeconomic landscape uh, requires some kind of policy attention towards consumption, electoral results also indicate to such kind of, uh, uh, you know, there is a possibility that... Uh, there was disappointment amongst people because right. of uh, high inflation and tepid consumption that showed up in electoral results. So I think there is a need to uh, cut taxes. But at the same time, one has to not lose sight of the uh, fiscal consolidation, which is equally important at this time. We've talked about last week about Indian bonds getting included in uh, the JP Morgan index right. and uh, government also pitching for a ratings upgrade. Now that we've got uh, improvement in the outlook from negative to stable, mm -hmm. we got that improvement in the outlook. So all this would require us to not lose sight of fiscal prudence and uh, be committed on the path to fiscal consolidation. So that would require that at least retain the path of 5.1%, do not deviate from that. Bring it down, but do not deviate from that because deviating from that will be something very unfavorable for uh, bond markets. It will increase the borrowing, it will increase yield and will have a detrimental impact on this bond inclusion because currently if you look at the bond uh, inflows, uh, because the US has indicated a cut in interest rates, right. we are seeing a huge surge of uh, fund flows in the Asian uh, bonds, emerging bond. That right. could reverse suddenly if there is any mm. indication that the government is not serious about its fiscal consolidation roadmap. Okay, so now Mridul has a, a question related to this. He says, uh, he asks, does it make sense to follow fiscal rules? The government has already done away with the revenue deficit target, uh, which was a very important clause. Plus, many people say that due to these FRBM targets, Fiscal policy has become pro-cyclical instead of counter. Arvind Subramanian says that we should just focus on having small primary surpluses. So he asked, like, could you, uh, could we please explain the literature on the subject and what have been the consequences of all of these fiscal rules? Yeah, so fiscal rules by, you know, the efficacy depends on the design of fiscal rules mm -hmm. uh, and how uh, seriously they are being enforced. So we have a, a paper on this where we track the trajectory of FRBM since it was introduced in 2004. And, you know, the problem with FRBM is that it has the goalposts have been changed way too often. In 20, 2009, in 2008, when the, at the time of global financial crisis, the FRBM Act was suspended. 
and right. there is no clause for suspension of the FRBM Act if you look at the Act as such. So there is no clause, but it was suspended. And then in 2012, that suspension was revoked. It was brought into uh, action again. But then again in 2015, 2018, again the goalposts were uh, changed. Constantly shifted. Constantly shifted. Uh, so the 3% fiscal deficit target was, which was to be achieved in 2009, till now hasn't been achieved. So it all depends on the design, how it is being. Uh, uh, enforce so uh, by itself fiscal rules are very important because they are a measure of accountability and as regards uh, in 2018 we saw that after the NK Singh committee report mm -hmm. the entire FRBM framework was uh, amended and uh, the goalpost was changed from revenue deficit to debt to GDP ratio so now we have the fiscal deficit and the debt which I think is more important than just looking at revenue deficit mm -hmm. because we want to understand the stock of outstanding debt of central and state government and that is something which the credit rating agencies look at very carefully that is uh, a very important uh, uh, anchor for fiscal policy and it should be uh, that way so fiscal rules are important and if you look at the cross country literature around also fiscal rules have imparted discipline and right. there are various institutional mechanisms that have been put forth in place uh, for, uh, you know, either uh, uh, post facto review of the government's performance. For example, in some countries, there's something called the fiscal councils. Now, right. uh, 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 in our country, that was not accepted because we have a CAG, mm -hmm. which provides a, a report on the compliance of FRBM. But in other countries, some of the other countries, we do have a fiscal council. So what is important is to ensure that the, uh, uh, the FRBM is amended and uh, it reflects the change realities because as of now also, we know that it's still not reflecting the new uh, glide path. So there's a lot of scope for improving the design of fiscal framework in India. But if we look at the literature, properly implemented fiscal rules do help in imparting fiscal discipline. Of course. And now if you're looking also just to see whether these fiscal rules even affect you and me and the, the, the general public, they of course do. Because uh, first of all, if the government casts all of these fiscal rules by the wayside and starts spending lots and increasing the deficit, right. yeah. then number one, inflation goes up. Number two, it has to pay for this deficit by borrowing, which means that the interest payments start piling up, which means all of the taxes that you and I pay, more and more of that is actually going into paying just interest rather than going into something productive. So there is a lot of value in the government being disciplined in how it spends its money. Yes, yeah, so, and that relates to the concept of primary deficit because if your mm -hmm. interest is rising, that means your primary deficit is exploding right. and that has implications for debt uh, sustainability because one of the important conditions for debt sustainability as Arvind Subramanian is pointing out is to have a primary surplus. Mm -hmm. That means at least you are having a surplus on the, your non-interest expenditure is, uh, you know, more. Right. It's not that you are in, you are borrowing for paying interest payments. Yes. And uh, now, capital expenditure is another area that the government has been spending a lot on. And it's expected that uh, even going by the interim budget, that they will increase their spending on CapEx. But Abhinav asks, do you think that the government is overdoing the CapEx emphasis now? As beyond a point, it is not only crowding out private investment, but also limiting the government's ability to deliver on public health and primary education, which is something that only the government can. Yeah, that's a good valid question. And uh, we need to understand the backdrop uh, within which this, uh, you know, focus on CapEx started. Mm. It was started in response to the COVID-induced disruption right. when private investment became anemic and it shied away from investments and therefore the government took CapEx as one of the uh, levers to pump prime the economy. And that is uh, continuing and that is uh, not only in terms of the absolute levels but also as a person to GDP. We have seen that there has been a steady rise in uh, capital expenditure as a share of GDP and uh, even in the interim budget we saw capital expenditure 
expenditure pegged at uh, 3.4 percent of uh, GDP. Right. Yes, going forward, there is uh, there is limits to how much the government can spend, and more so now when there are uh, other uh, demands on the government's uh, fisc. There are demands from coalition partners. There is an increasing uh, demand for spending more on the rural sector, on agricultural infrastructure, on making agriculture more uh, resilient to climate uh, uh, change. So there is a need for some reorientation. So what I think going forward would happen is that it may well be that the absolute level of capital expenditure does not fall. But mm -hmm. as a share of GDP, we may see that it peaks around this. Uh, or even the growth might be lower. Growth might be lower or the, as a share of GDP, it, it gets peaked at this level, doesn't mm -hmm. rise uh, further. And that is how the balancing act uh, uh, could be achieved. Uh, another point is that, you know, this, uh, this uh, uh, interest-free loan which is given to states for capex yes. that is also something which states are demanding so there is a there is a, a demand for that uh, there is disbursement for that so it's not something that the government can do away with completely mm -hmm. uh, and therefore uh, the focus on capital expenditure will continue but albeit at a moderating pace okay and uh, now Sanjay has a question which I think we have addressed but I'll ask it anyway he asked, uh, uh, many state governments are doing, uh, are doling out freebies to appease voters. Why should the central government be any different? The trend was started by the Ahmadmi party and now it has become necessary for any party to remain or to get power. Yeah, so freebies have been used and uh, now there is a very you know thin line of distinction between what we call freebies or subsidies or merit goods, demerit goods. Mm -hmm. And the government has been providing subsidies. We see the PM Kisan, we see fertilizer subsidies. So the support has continued. The free food. The free food. So we see that it's not that the central government is not, uh, you know, uh, uh, is not adopting freebies as a part to support the citizens of the country. But at the same time, we need to see its implications for the fiscal consolidation. Exactly. And it's very important at this point in time, you know, the budget should be used as an opportunity by the government to articulate a medium term uh, debt and fiscal deficit strategy beyond FY26. Because FY26 is next year. So what happens after that? What is the uh, thought process for achieving, say, a 4% fiscal deficit and then further a 3% fiscal deficit. Mm -hmm. So all that uh, requires restructuring, rationalization of expenditure and focusing on productive expenditure, not losing sight of uh, fiscal prudence uh, and at the same time continuing focus on the uh, vulnerable sections in a focused manner. Apart from the demand boosting measures, there are also certain things that the government can do to generate employment because yeah. that's a critical issue right now. So what are some of the things that can come in the budget that can address this? Yeah, so it's come at a time when we had the CLEMS database where, you know, we saw that mm -hmm. uh, employment provisional estimates show a 6% growth. But at the same time, if we look at the sectoral distribution of employment, we see that agriculture still employs more than 40% of the workforce. Yeah. And the sectors that are employing more workforce are uh, uh, having less productivity. Mm -hmm. You know, the CLEMS database also gives data on uh, uh, value added per worker, which is yeah. the labor productivity and we see that agriculture, construction and trade, which are one of the, you know, the three most uh, prominent employers, but in terms of productivity, they are relatively, they are laggard. So there is a need to improve the quality of expenditure. Uh, one thing that can be done is to give some kind of a focus to uh, labor intensive sectors like textile, like mm -hmm. to toy man manufacturers and the, uh, it could be, uh, there could be a scheme on the same lines as the PLI which is the employment linked scheme or maybe employment linked uh, incentives could be added to the production linked incentive schemes for labor intensive sectors and it should have a sunset clause. It should not be something that continues indefinitely but it should uh, give some kind of incentives for companies to, you know, absorb the unskilled labor or relatively semi-skilled workers. And for the skilled workers, I think it's very important to, you know, conduct kind of a nationwide skill survey to understand where the skill gap, uh, where the right. skill deficit exists, uh, what are the skill requirements of uh, the various uh, industries and give some kind of SOPs and incentives for industry academia collaboration, how academia can further improvise on its syllabi so that it becomes more useful 
for absorption of uh, skill so more tangible steps are needed for different kind of uh, skilled workers so that the problem can be addressed because uh, you know it's not something that can be done only in budget it's a medium to long term thing and if we have to move towards a developed country nation this is something which is important and some steps could be initiated in this year's budget no without a doubt uh, the issue of employment is absolutely critical a lot of people are feeling the pinch but there you go that's what we have for you the the budget has two broad ways that it can spend its money or allocate the money that it has one is to use it to reduce its debt or to uh, consolidate its finances reduce the fiscal deficit targets or the other is to generate demand in the economy cut some taxes uh, invest in agricultural sectors rural economy and to generate more jobs now the thing is uh, after our discussion what we can kind of figure out is that yes the government needs to strike a balance between the two but instead of 50 50 between the two mm -hmm. options it should be more like 65% towards uh, demand and job generation and 35% towards fiscal consolidation it shouldn't of course uh, miss its fiscal deficit targets but it doesn't need to go all that aggressively in trying to reduce them the focus more should be on generating demand in the economy but on that note that's all from us thank you so much for watching